Chapter Four of Middlemarch by George Eliot. Recording by Margaret Espayat. First gentleman, our deeds are fetters that we forge ourselves. Second gentleman, I truly, but I think it is the world that brings the iron. Sir James seems determined to do everything you wish," said Celia as they were driving home from an inspection of the new building site. "He is a good creature and more sensible than any one would imagine," said Dorothea inconsiderately. "You mean that he appears silly?" "No, no," said Dorothea, recollecting herself and laying her hand on her sister's a moment. "But he does not talk equally well on all subjects." I should think none but disagreeable people do," said Celia in her usual purring way. "They must be very dreadful to live with. Only think at breakfast and always." Dorothea laughed. "Oh, Kitty, you are a wonderful creature." She pinched Celia's chin, being in the mood now to think her very winning and lovely, fit hereafter to be an eternal cherub. And if it were not doctrinally wrong to say so, hardly more in need of salvation than a squirrel. Of course, people need not be always talking well. Only one tells the quality of their minds when they try to talk well. You mean that Sir James tries and fails? I was speaking generally. Why do you catechize me about Sir James? It is not the object of his life to please me. Now, Dodo, can you really believe that? Certainly, he thinks of me as a future sister. That is all. Dorothea had never hinted this before, waiting from a certain shyness on such subjects, which was mutual between the sisters, until it should be introduced by some decisive event. Celia blushed, but said at once, "Pray do not make that mistake any longer, Dodo." When Tantrip was brushing my hair the other day, she said that Sir James Mann knew from Mrs. Cadwallader's maid that Sir James was to marry the eldest Miss Brook. How can you let Tantrip talk such gossip to you, Celia? Said Dorothea indignantly, not the less angry because details asleep in her memory were now awakened to confirm the unwelcome revelation. You must have asked her questions. It is degrading. I see no harm at all in Tantrip's talking to me. It is better to hear what people say. You see what mistakes you make by taking up notions. I am quite sure that Sir James means to make you an offer, and he believes that you will accept him, especially since you have been so pleased with him about the plans. And Uncle too, I know he expects it. Every one can see that Sir James is very much in love with you. The revulsion was so strong and painful in Dorothea's mind that the tears welled up and flowed abundantly. All her dear plans were embittered, and she thought with disgust of Sir James conceiving that she recognized him as her lover. There was vexation too on account of Celia. How could he expect it? She burst forth in her most impetuous manner. I have never agreed with him about anything but the cottages. I was barely polite to him before, but you have been so pleased with him since then. He has begun to feel quite sure that you are fond of him. Fond of him, Celia? How can you choose such odious expressions? Said Dorothea passionately. Dear me, Dorothea, I suppose it would be right for you to be fond of a man whom you accepted for a husband. It is offensive to me to say that Sir James could think I was fond of him. Besides, it is not the right word for the feeling I must have towards the man I would accept as a husband. Well, I am sorry for Sir James. I thought it right to tell you, because you went on as you always do, never looking just where you are and treading in the wrong place. You always see what nobody else sees. It is impossible to satisfy you, yet you never see what is quite plain. That's your way, Dodo. Something certainly gave Celia unusual courage, and she was not sparing the sister of whom she was occasionally in awe. Who can tell what just criticisms, mere the cat may be passing on us, 
beings of wider speculation. It is very painful, said Dorothea, feeling scourged. I can have no more to do with the cottages. I must be uncivil to him. I must tell him I will have nothing to do with them. It is very painful. Her eyes filled again with tears. Wait a little. Think about it. You know he is going away for a day or two to see his sister. There will be nobody besides Lovegood. Celia could not help relenting. Poor Dodo, she went on in an amiable staccato. It is very hard. It is your favorite fad to draw plans. Fad to draw plans? Do you think I only care about my fellow creatures' houses in that childish way? I may well make mistakes. How can one ever do anything nobly Christian living among people with such petty thoughts? No more was said. Dorothea was too much jarred to recover her temper and behave so as to show that she admitted any error in herself. She was disposed rather to accuse the intolerable narrowness and the purblind conscience of the society around her. And Celia was no longer the eternal cherub, but a thorn in her spirit, a pink and white nullifidian, worse than any discouraging presence in the pilgrim's progress, the fad of drawing plans. What was life worth? What great faith was possible when the whole effect of one's actions could be withered up into such parched rubbish as that? When she got out of the carriage, her cheeks were pale and her eyelids red. She was an image of sorrow, and her uncle who met her in the hall would have been alarmed if Celia had not been close to her, looking so pretty and composed, that he at once concluded Dorothea's tears to have their origin in her excessive religiousness. He had returned during their absence from a journey to the county town about a petition for the pardon of some criminal. "'Well, my dears,' he said kindly as they went up to kiss him, "'I hope nothing disagreeable has happened while I have been away.' "'No, uncle,' said Celia. "'We have been to Freshet to look at the cottages. "'We thought you would have been home to lunch.' "'I came by Lowick to lunch. "'You didn't know I came by Lowick. "'And I have brought a couple of pamphlets for you, Dorothea. "'In the library, you know. "'They lie on the table in the library.' It seemed as if an electric stream went through Dorothea, thrilling her from despair into expectation. They were pamphlets about the early church. The oppression of Celia, Tantrip, and Sir James was shaken off, and she walked straight to the library. Celia went upstairs. Mr. Brooke was detained by a message, but when he re-entered the library, he found Dorothea seated and already deep in one of the pamphlets, which had some marginal manuscript of Mr. Casabon's, taking it in as eagerly as she might have taken in the scent of a fresh bouquet after a dry, hot, dreary walk. She was getting away from Tipton and Freshet, and her own sad liability to tread in the wrong places on her way to the New Jerusalem. Mr. Brooke sat down in his armchair, stretched his legs toward the wood fire, which had fallen into a wondrous mass of glowing dice between the dogs, and rubbed his hands gently, looking very mildly towards Dorothea, but with a neutral, leisurely air, as if he had nothing particular to say. Dorothea closed her pamphlet, as soon as she was aware of her uncle's presence, and rose as if to go. Usually she would have been interested about her uncle's merciful errand on behalf of the criminal, but her late agitation had made her absent-minded. "'I came back by Lowick, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, not as if with any intention to arrest her departure, but apparently from his usual tendency to say what he had said before. This fundamental principle of human speech was markedly exhibited in Mr. Brooke. "'I lunched there and saw Casabon's library and that kind of thing. There's a sharp air driving.' "'Won't you sit down, my dear? You look cold.' Dorothea felt quite inclined to accept the invitation. Sometimes, when her uncle's easy way of taking things did not happen to be exasperating, it was rather soothing. She threw off her mantle and bonnet, 
and sat down opposite to him, enjoying the glow, but lifting up her beautiful hands for a screen. They were not thin hands or small hands, but powerful, feminine, maternal hands. She seemed to be holding them up in propitiation for her passionate desire to know and to think, which in the unfriendly mediums of Tipton and Freshett had issued in crying and red eyelids. She bethought herself now of the condemned criminal. What news have you brought about the sheep stealer, Uncle? What, poor Bunch? Well, it seems we can't get him off. He is to be hanged. Dorothea's brow took an expression of reprobation and pity. Hanged, you know, said Mr. Brook with a quiet nod. Poor Romilly. He would have helped us. I knew Romilly. Casabon didn't know Romilly. He is a little buried in books, you know, Casabon is. When a man has great studies and is writing a great work, he must, of course, give up seeing much of the world. How can he go about making acquaintances? That's true. But a man mopes, you know. I have always been a bachelor, too, but I have that sort of disposition that I never moped. It was my way to go about everywhere and take in everything. I never moped. But I can see that Casabon does, you know. He wants a companion. A companion, you know. It would be a great honor to anyone to be his companion, said Dorothea energetically. You like him, eh? said Mr. Brooke without showing any surprise or other emotion. Well, now, I've known Casabon ten years, ever since he came to Lowick, but I never got anything out of him, any ideas, you know. However, he is a tip-top man, and may be a bishop, that kind of thing, you know, if Peel stays in. And he has a very high opinion of you, my dear. Dorothea could not speak. The fact is... He has a very high opinion indeed of you, and he speaks uncommonly well, does Casabon. He has deferred to me, you not being of age. In short, I have promised to speak to you, though I told him I thought there was not much chance. I was bound to tell him that. I said, my niece is very young and that kind of thing. But I didn't think it necessary to go into everything. However, the long and the short of it is that he has asked my permission to make you an offer of marriage. Of marriage, you know, said Mr. Brooke with his explanatory nod. I thought it better to tell you, my dear. No one could have detected any anxiety in Mr. Brooke's manner, but he did really wish to know something of his niece's mind, that if there were any need for advice, he might give it in time. What feeling he, as a magistrate who had taken in so many ideas, could make room for, was unmixedly kind. Since Dorothea did not speak immediately, he repeated, I thought it better to tell you, my dear. Thank you, uncle, said Dorothea, in a clear, unwavering tone. I am very grateful to Mr. Casabon. If he makes me an offer, I shall accept him. I admire and honor him more than any man I ever saw. Mr. Brooke paused a little, and then said in a lingering low tone, Ah, well, he is a good match in some respects. But now, Chetham is a good match, and our land lies together. I shall never interfere against your wishes, my dear. People should have their own way in marriage, and that sort of thing, up to a certain point, you know. I have always said that, up to a certain point. I wish you to marry well, and I have good reason to believe that Chetham wishes to marry you. I mention it, you know. It is impossible that I should ever marry Sir James Chetham, said Dorothea. If he thinks of marrying me, he has made a great mistake. That is it, you see. One never knows. I should have thought Chetham was just the sort of man a woman would like now. Pray do not mention him in that light again, uncle, said Dorothea, feeling some of her late irritation revive. Mr. Brooke wondered, 
and felt that women were an inexhaustible subject of study, since even he at his age was not in a perfect state of scientific prediction about them. Here was a fellow like Chetham with no chance at all. But, well, Casabon now, there is no hurry, I mean, for you. It's true, every year will tell upon him. He is over five and forty, you know. I should say a good seven and twenty years older than you. To be sure, if you like learning and standing and that sort of thing, we can't have everything. And his income is good. He has a handsome property independent of the church. His income is good. Still, he is not young, and I must not conceal from you, my dear, that I think his health is not over strong. I know nothing else against him. I should not wish to have a husband very near my own age, said Dorothea with grave decision. I should wish to have a husband who was above me in judgment and in all knowledge. Mr. Brooke repeated his subdued, Ah, I thought you had more of your own opinion than most girls. I thought you liked your own opinion, liked it, you know. I cannot imagine myself living without some opinions, but I should wish to have good reasons for them, and a wise man could help me to see which opinions had the best foundation and would help me to live according to them. Very true. You couldn't put the thing better. Couldn't put it better beforehand, you know. But there are oddities in things, continued Mr. Brooke, whose conscience was really roused to do the best he could for his niece on this occasion. Life isn't cast in a mold, not cut out by rule and line, and that sort of thing. I never married myself, and it will be the better for you and yours. The fact is, I never loved anyone well enough to put myself into a noose for them. It is a noose, you know. Temper now, there is temper, and a husband likes to be master. I know that I must expect trials, uncle. Marriage is a state of higher duties. I never thought of it as a mere personal ease, said poor Dorothea. Well, you are not fond of show, a great establishment, balls, dinners, and that kind of thing. I can see that Casabon's ways might suit you better than Chetham's. And you shall do as you like, my dear. I would not hinder Casabon. I said so at once for there is no knowing how anything may turn out. You have not the same tastes as every young lady, and a clergyman and a scholar, who may be a bishop, that kind of thing, may suit you better than Chetham. Chetham is a good fellow, a good, sound-hearted fellow, you know, but he doesn't go much into ideas. I did when I was his age. But Casabon's eyes now. I think he has hurt them with a little too much reading. I should be all the happier, uncle, the more room there was for me to help him, said Dorothea ardently. You have quite made up your mind, I see. Well, my dear, the fact is, I have a letter for you in my pocket. Mr. Brooke handed the letter to Dorothea, but as she rose to go away, he added, There is not too much hurry, my dear. Think about it, you know. When Dorothea had left him, he reflected that he had certainly spoken strongly, he had put the risks of marriage before her in a striking manner. It was his duty to do so. But as to pretending to be wise for young people, no uncle, however much he had traveled in his youth, absorbed the new ideas and dined with celebrities now deceased, could pretend to judge what sort of marriage would turn out well for a young girl who preferred Casabon to Chetham. In short, Woman was a problem which, since Brooke's mind felt blank before it, could be hardly less complicated than the revolutions of an irregular solid. End of chapter 4